Thank you, thank you, Paul, for the introduction. I was a bit worried when I saw that the um, lunch was in room 101. Um, those of you that have read George Orwell will know that that is where uh, victims of the brave new world government face their own worst fears. <clears throat> um, but actually, um, this doesn't feel like my own worst fear, at least uh, not yet, anyway. Um, I want to begin by thanking the University of Delaware for hosting a fabulous conference and uh, uh, Pat Harker and Dan Rich for, for making this occasion and indeed the series of, uh, of events that I know this is part of. I think it's a, a fantastic role for a, a university to play in uh, changing the, the community and the state uh, around it as well as uh, the other great things it does. And I also want to thank uh, Skip Schoenholz for uh, the conversations we've had over the last year or two and Paul Herdman not just for his introduction but for the work that the Rodell Foundation is doing and the, the dialogue I've had with them. And while I'm... Um, uh, congratulating people, I would like to salute the work of um, Governor Minner and uh, Secretary Woodruff and all those other people who've been responsible for the progress that you've made in this state uh, over the recent years. And finally, the authors um, uh, of the uh, Vision 2015 document, which I think is a fantastic piece of global benchmarking and exactly the kind of document that is needed to uh, uh, face people up to the challenge of what it really takes to become world class. So with those thanks out of the way, let me tell you how I'd like to spend uh, the 40 minutes or so uh, ahead. I want to um, bring three distinct perspectives to bear on what I say. First, um, as Paul said, I'm a, an outsider with some knowledge of education systems around the world, and I want to comment how the, on how the school system in Delaware, and indeed the US, looks against international benchmarks. And you can think of that as speaking from the head. Second, also, as Paul mentioned, I'm a battle-hardened veteran of the Blair government's controversial school reforms, and I want to draw some lessons from that experience, which was broadly successful, as Paul indicates, but also messy and error-strewn, and it took us from being below average to above average in international comparisons, but we're not yet world-class. And these thoughts are, in the words of the great Theodore Roosevelt, thoughts from the man in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, rather than those critics who Roosevelt calls cold, timid souls who know neither victory or defeat. Think of this as speaking from the gut. And then third, as a committed friend of this country who majored uh, long ago in American history at Oxford and has been fascinated by ever since by trying to unravel your country's uh, many mysteries, <coughs> I want to comment on the struggle over more than two centuries to close the gap between the American dream and the American reality. And one of, the reason, one of the virtues, I think, of a good friend should surely be that he or she can say what otherwise might be left unsaid. And you can think of this as speaking from the heart. I believe school reform in America is at a critical juncture. In the next year or so, it will be necessary to choose between two broad options. On the one hand, a retreat to the comfortable, introverted, input-focused, evidence-light approach that characterized education reform in the last three decades of the 20th century, during which time Americans tried and failed to live up to the towering ambitions of the civil rights movement. On the other, an advance to the demanding, outward-looking, results-focused, evidence-informed approach towards which some promising progress has been made in this state and elsewhere in recent times. That choice will be made in governor's mansions, in state capitals, in city halls, and in school boards across the country while at federal level, the reauthorization of the No Child Left Behind Act, whenever it comes, uh, will be the moment of truth. But here in Delaware, the central issue will be the degree of commitment made to the implementation of Vision 2015. And in this sense, in this, sense this state has a fantastic opportunity to lead the nation. The decisive factors in the making of that choice that I've described will be the accumulating evidence of what works, and indeed what doesn't, and the courage of those who lead the public education system at every level from the governor through to the schools and those who shape the opinion uh, within the system uh, and, in the business, and among businesses and communities. With you've made an impressive contribution already, but as you know better than I do, the progress you've made is only a beginning. In the words of that great poet Robert Frost, two roads are diverging in the wood and the choice that you make in this state and others make around the country will make all the difference. As you prepare to face that choice, I want to do three things today. I want to glance back at the past, show where you've come from. 
I want to assess the present where you are now, and I want to sketch the future, which you've done uh, very well, uh, and I want to reinforce. So let me begin with the past. In 1955, which happens to be the year I was born, the, the, it was also the year that General Motors achieved a US market share of 50% two years before the Sputnik was launched and America lost its post-war self-confidence, and also the year that the American high school reached its zenith. It was the year of Greece, uh, uh, or self, uh, uh, among other things. But it only reached its zenith for white kids, because a year earlier, as you all know, the Supreme Court had momentously decided in Brown versus the Board of Education that the education that white kids received should ultimately be available to all and that way set up the terms of the debate for the ensuing decades. Up to that time, 1955, and indeed beyond, the US had a huge comparative advantage in education over all other countries, as demonstrated in the work of Claudia Goldin and Larry Katz. As they put it, during the first three quarters of the 20th century, educational attainment in the United States rose, ra rose rapidly. This was largely due to the existence of universally available high school education but also to the growing availability of college. Because good schooling brings very long-run benefits, America's educational leadership over the rest of the world brought substanti substantial relative gains in economic growth right through to the end of the 20th century. Even now, the US leads the world in the college graduate share of those aged 55 to 64. But in the last quarter of the 20th century, educational attainment in this country stagnated. Countries which, educationally speaking, had been trailing in America's wake for most of the 20th century began to catch up. As Golden and Katz explain in their book, the slowdown in the educational attainment of young Americans at the end of the 20th century is especially striking when compared with the acceleration of schooling among many nations in Europe and parts of Asia where educational change has been exceedingly rapid. This relative slide in the educational performance of the US has had and will continue to have economic consequences. Since a greater level of education results in higher labor productivity and therefore tends to foster a higher rate of aggregate growth, relative weakness in education puts at risk long-term economic growth rates. The recent work of Eric Hanasek and others reinforces this case by demonstrating the strong positive correlation between the performance of countries in international comparisons such as PISA and TIMS and their rates of economic growth. Having looked at the international comparisons in science and maths over the last 40 years, Hanasek and the others conclude higher levels of cognitive skill appear to play a major role in explaining differences in economic growth rates. They show that the US has fallen relatively in these international comparisons and is now at best average. Some suggest given the strong growth in the US over the last two decades, that this doesn't really matter, or as Gerald Bracey recently put it, our schools are better than the critics claim. This is a dangerously complacent line to take. The time lag in the relationship between schooling and economic growth is long. Look at the data of Andreas Schleicher of the OECD. In the 1960s, the US led the world in high school qualifications, and Korea was 27th. Now Korea leads the world and the US is 13th and falling. As recently as 1995, the US was second in the world on college level graduation rates. Just a decade later, it had slipped to 14th, slightly below the OECD average. This slippage is not the result of a lack of investment which remains relatively high in the US, rather it reflects, to use hard economic terms, a lack of productivity. The point is reinforced by the fact that in the international comparisons of younger children, the US does relatively well, which given the country's wealth is what you would expect. The problem is that as they get older, children make less progress each year than the children in the best performing countries. Here, we're not just talking about poor kids in poor neighborhoods, we're talking about most kids in most neighborhoods. The challenge is acute in Delaware, which has historically been funded above the average for the US, uh, while performing slightly below the average, and though the recent improvement is welcome, it's not enough. Moreover, there is no comfort in the belief that future economic success depends not so much on overall levels of cognitive skill in the population, but rather on ensuring that at least a few brilliant rocket scientists come through. Hanasek and the others show convincingly in the 21st century that having a substantial cadre of high performers and 
near universal basic skills are both essential. In short, that choice is a false one and the debate a distraction. Summarising then, as Governor Minna remarked this morning, long term, the future, future success of the American economy will depend on significantly improving the US school and college system with all the urgency that can be mustered. Indeed, because of the inevitable time lag, even with the most rapid imaginable reform, it will be some years before the impact is felt on economic growth. No wonder, therefore, that business leaders often play a leading role in driving school reform in Delaware and many other states. They see the hard edge of these issues. As James Wolfe remarked this morning, education is the cornerstone of economic development. It's one thing in a global economy to offshore, offshore unskilled, labor, uh, unskilled jobs because labor is cheaper elsewhere. It's quite another to offshore highly, highly skilled jobs simply because the qualified workforce can't be found. But all too often, that's become the reality. Equally importantly, though, school reform in this country has never been just a question of economics, important though that is. From the beginning of the Republic, education was seen as a fundamental building block of democracy and freedom. Jefferson was giving expression to a universal belief when he said, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. This idealism was one of the reasons why the US made much earlier and more rapid progress towards universal public education than many countries in Europe. The state of New York, for example, established universal public education in 1812, not matched even remotely in England until 1870. In fact, in 1812, the British were more preoccupied with shelling the White House. <laughs> the roots of the comparative advantage Golden and Katz identified in the 20th century, therefore, lie deep in the previous century. From the 1950s onwards, the realization of this ideal, an ideal, ideal which underpinned the American dream throughout, became central to the burgeoning civil rights movement, the first in the Deep South, where the grotesque educational inequality that was clear was placed firmly on the agenda by Brown versus the Board of Education, but later in the northern cities as the hopes of the diaspora turned all too often to despair. There were, of course, many strands to the civil rights movement, all wonderfully woven together in Taylor Branch's monumental trilogy, America in the King Years. Two things in that account are both striking and relevant to our agenda. One is that the movement in the 1960s, while symbolized by great set-piece speeches or new legislation, was in practice the accumulation of numberless acts of often unrewarded, unnoticed heroism, which, like ripples on an ocean, combined to become an irresistible tide. You see equivalent inspiring acts of educational heroism in schools and communities across this state and this country now to become an ocean tide. The second lesson from the civil rights movement is that the leaders of that time believed firmly that once equal access to school and college had been achieved, equal success would follow. Listen to Martin Luther King speaking to African-American students in Cleveland in 1964. Doors of opportunity are opening now that were not opened to your mothers and fathers. The great challenge, he said, facing you is to be ready to enter those doors. If they are ready, he implies, access will be enough. Listen to President Johnson promising every child a place to sit and a teacher to learn from. He too makes the same assumption that access would be enough. While some civil rights leaders expected it to take decades to make up the ground, Bob Moses commented it would take 50 years to work this through. All of them expected that the ground would be made up in time. In relation to education, those expectations have not been realized. Dig deeper than the headlines, and the evidence is compelling. Not only does the US perform somewhat below OECD averages in the recent PISA, it also suffers from a very high socioeconomic impact on student performance. Delaware is no exception to this rule. In other words, rather than overcoming the social differences children bring with them when they start school, the US system, like ours in the UK, tends to reinforce them. As Golden and Katz argue, the slowdown in the growth of educational attainment is the single most important factor in increasing wage differentials since 1980, and it is a major contributor to increased family inequality. Those who led the civil rights movement, whether in Congress, the churches, or communities, must surely be devastated by the actual outcomes 40 or 50 years later. We know now that access to school is not enough. It's success in school that matters. 
We know that at the heart of education reform, at the heart of success, not access, is the quality of what happens in classrooms, the skills and knowledge, the expectations and ambitions, the consistency and dedication which teachers bring to the task of enabling students, whatever their background, to achieve the standards necessary for life, work and citizenship in the very demanding 21st century. Though no one believes it will be enough on its own, achieving the ambitions for 2014 set by NCLB would be a great start for this country. Advancing the Vision 2015 agenda could be a great contribution from this state. These far from easy tasks have become, I would venture to suggest, the emerging frontier in the drive to realize civil rights in this country. History suggests, therefore, that right now, there is a great challenge facing America. Both future economic success and the wider aspirations at the heart of the very idea of America depend on vastly improving the outcomes of public education. The great threat to the country's future is that for a range of reasons, it might fail to rise to this challenge. Then, for, Mer for many, the American dream will never be more than a dream. The great opportunity is that a combination of business and civil rights leaders and bipartisan political leadership could become unstoppable. Right now, here in Delaware, as well as across the country, these issues hang in the balance. Let me now look at the present and assess the negative side of the ledger, my fears first. One worry I have is the sheer difficulty of getting things done in this country. Much more difficult than in many countries, including my own. Of course, successful large-scale change is never easy, but in the Blair era, when the government had a large majority in Parliament and significant popular support, rapid progress really was possible, as were significant rapid blunders. <laughs> Partly in reaction to that very British constitution, your founding fathers separated the powers between three branches and two levels and made a similar dispersion often at state level. Add to that a culture in this country which is historically suspicious of the very concept of government, rarely more evident, by the way, than in this historic week. <laughs> it's almost as if George III was lurking behind every filing cabinet. <laughs> Put all that together and the challenges become much greater than in most European or Asian countries then add to that the power and organization of those who defend the status quo in public education, face up to the legacy of failed attempts to bring about bold reform, and the result is a widespread sense of defeat in people's heads before they even begin. Across the country, people sigh along with that right Russian prime minister in the 1990s who said on leaving office after just one year in the post, we tried to do better, but everything turned out as usual. Moreover, these organizational and cultural barriers within the system are compounded by the worrying lack of anxiety among American people about public education. It seems when you look at the data that the public in this country is resigned to the state of its public schools rather than satisfied or delighted with them. Education Next's fall issue this year finds that if parents could issue letter grades to the system as schools do to students, just 20% would give an A or a B, just 2% would give an A. People are significantly more satisfied with their police forces and post offices. Even so, there is little re recognition that unless public education significantly improves in the near future, there is a disaster in the making. Education systems don't fail with the suddenness of a natural disaster, but the consequences can be just as devastating. In a moment of despair, James Baldwin once observed that civilizations are destroyed not by wickedness, but by spinelessness. How many Americans see education as the top priority in facing up to the long-term economic challenges the country faces? If public education really is the frontier of the civil rights movement, where are the modern equivalents of the Freedom Rides and the Freedom Summer? Where is the clamor? How is it that a leading elected official in another state could say to me recently that if one youth was beaten by the police, there were mass protests, but if thousands of youths were failed day after day by the schools, no one lifted a finger? Delaware, by taking a lead, may be ahead of the other states, but if, under, if I understand what people here are telling me, there are no grounds for complacency. 
John F. Kennedy first made his name as a young man in 1940 by publishing an essay about the appeasement, in the 1930, the appeasement of Hitler in the 1930s, and he called it Why England Slept. I hope in 10 years' time, no one looking back on this country's attempts to grapple with education reform will feel the need to write Why America Slept. Still less, by the way, Why Delaware Slept. Fortunately, these anxieties are balanced by very real grounds for hope. To start with, wherever I go in America, I sense a growing recognition among the country's leaders at local, state and national level that public education needs fixing. You can feel it in this room now. Furthermore, many of those leaders are ready to look abroad as well as at home for solutions. Delaware's excellent Vision 2015 report that I mentioned earlier and the coalition that supports it is a perfect illustration of my point. Moreover, not the least consequence of the No Child Left Behind Act is much greater clarity in the data about the extent of the problem. And again, Delaware's analysis of its own challenge is exemplary. A much clearer diagnosis doesn't automatically lead to the cure, but it is a major step forward. In addition, again assisted by the data, we're increasingly well informed about, to use Tony Blair's favorite phrase, what works. We have change of schools such as KIPP, Aspire, and Green Dot that demonstrably succeed where many in the past have failed. We have whole systems such as Boston, Chicago, and New York City, which are driving bold reform and delivering improved results. We have organizations like Teach for America, the New Teacher Project, and New Leaders for New Schools, showing how apparently insurmountable human capital challenges can in fact be surmounted. We have not-for-profit organizations such as Education Trust and Achieve with deep expertise in crucial areas. We have foundations, Gates, Broad and Dell, for example, willing to take risks and invest substantially in bold alternatives to the inadequacies of the present. And at state and local level, as you see in this very room now, there are businesses, community organizations and foundations acting with a similar sense of purpose. Never before has there been so much insight in this country into how to bring about successful change, nor, nor such substantial capacity to deliver it. The question now, here and across the country, is whether political and educational leaders can seize that insight and that capacity and bring about irreversible progress soon. There is a further point. The very international comparisons that make such depressing reading for the US, and challenge the UK too, by the way, also indicate the way for the, for, forward. They demonstrate what can be done with evident progress in less than a decade with a combination of the right strategy and courageous sustained leadership. Singapore's story over 40 years is truly remarkable. So in an entirely different culture is Finland's over 30 years. Poland made tremendous progress in the last decade. The reforms in Alberta and Ontario just across the northern border where you're gonna take a visit soon are working too. This can be done which leads to my final ground for hope, the No Child Left Behind Act itself. Here was legislation which reached across political divides and set ambitious goals. It put no ceiling on educational performance, but for the first time, it fixed in federal legislation a high floor. It put the achievement gap on the agenda from sea to shining sea. To set a date for delivery as soon as 2014 was aspirational, certainly, and some critics say it's unrealistic and the due date should be postponed perhaps indefinitely. The same case is sometimes made here in relation to Vision 2015. Others say, provide the preschool and the capacity first and we'll come to the accountability later. Even if the American people in this state or elsewhere would accept a pay first and ask questions later approach, these arguments fail to recognize the degree of urgency. Moreover, the fact that there are schools right now achieving those 2014 or 2015 goals surely suggests that significant delay would be a mistake. In any case, from the perspective of the Freedom Summer of 1964, far from looking too soon, 2014 or 2015 looks half a century too late. As the then Vice President said, rejecting pleas for patience on the 100th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address, it is empty to plead that the solution to the dilemmas of the present rest on the hands of a clock. The solution is in our hands. Across the country, and in Delaware too, there are promising, albeit early, signs that progress really is being made. You heard about it this morning. Performance is improving, not enough, but at least heading in the right direction. Achievement gaps are narrowing, not yet transformatively, but increments are better than nothing. The current governor and secretary, and all of you involved, have much to be proud of, as well as challenges to face up to. So for me, 
what's happened since NCLB and in states such as this in the, in the last few years are real sources of hope. The question to my mind is not should this progress be reversed or abandoned, but how can it be refined and followed through? And in the last section, I want to turn to this and look to the future. It's clear that for all its qualities, the policy agenda which developed in the wake of NCLB does need refinement. A number of refinements in particular stand out from an international perspective. First, much depends on the quality of the assessments being used. Where poor tests are used, the information they provide will be misleading, with potentially dire consequences for the students themselves when they leave school and meet the real world coming the other way. Second, the introduction of growth models has brought welcome refinement to the accountability requirements, and it makes sense to build on this development as you're doing currently in Delaware. Growth models really are helpful as a measure of progress and an explanation of the scale of the challenge, but they're dangerous when they become a justification for poor performance or an, exp or an explanation, uh, a justification for lower expectations. Our experience in England suggests that growth or value-added models should be combined with a continuing focus on the absolute outcomes, which are, after all, all that matter to the individual student when he or she leaves school. These growth models need to be part of a refined, modern, student-based data system which puts the evidence at the fingertips of every professional at every level. Your emphasis in the vision network on data-driven decision-making, again, we heard about it this morning, is exactly the kind of thing I have in mind. Third, districts and states need to develop the capacity to act decisively in response to the data. They need to be able to recognize and reward those who succeed, especially those who succeed in challenging circumstances. They also need to be intervene effectively where progress is not what it needs to be. In England, not without difficulty or controversy, we did develop this latter capacity. Under pressure from us in central government, our equivalent of school districts did learn how to intervene effectively in underperforming schools. They did not apply pre-packaged interventions in mechanical sequence. Instead, they diagnosed the problem school by school and tailored the solution accordingly, answering the only question that matters in these circumstances, which is, what do we need to do to get these kids a good education as fast as possible? Nothing else matters. Sometimes, answering that question meant closure of the school and dispersal of the students to other schools. Sometimes it required the introduction of new providers and sometimes the replacement of a principal. Our districts varied in their technical capacity to do this and they also varied in the degree of political will they brought to it. It's always tempting in these difficult circumstances to give the benefit of the doubt, but doing so, in my experience, was almost always a mistake. After all, it raises the question, how come you were so doubtful? Meanwhile, at central government level, we intervened in districts which lacked the capacity to drive school improvement themselves and did so successfully in almost 10% of the total, which, among other things, incentivized the rest. I was intrigued by the proposal in the Vision 2015 uh, document for an Office of Innovation. Perhaps this could become a vehicle for working with high-performing schools to identify best practices and equally for developing creative solutions for the problems of underperformance across the state. Either way, the moral case for action is absolutely overwhelming. Which raises my fourth point. Successful education reform is as much about means as it is about ends. Getting the policy right is difficult to be sure, but it's relatively easy compared to making it happen. And to making it happen consistently, effectively, so that the benefits are felt in every classroom, by every student, by every parent, and indeed by every teacher. Policy failure, in other words, is as often a failure of implementation as it is of concept. Systems to need to develop both the technical capacity and the necessary mindset to deliver results. This is what in the Blair administration we self-mockingly called deliverology, the science of getting things done. Interestingly, whenever we applied deliverology effectively, it worked. And I'm talking not just about education, but about health, improving the railways, improving the criminal justice system, and so on. You will need in Delaware, in Delaware an equivalent of deliverology for yourselves if the ambitions of the Vision 2015 are to be realized. One of um, England's more hapless kings from the past, Charles I, once observed, just before they cut his head off, by the way, there is more to the doing than bidding it be done. And this is a very true thing. Fifth, there's much more to do 
to ensure that there's a highly effective teacher in every classroom and a highly effective principal in every school. It's especially important to ensure that the schools facing the toughest challenges have access as soon as possible to the most talented teachers and leaders. Doing so requires root and branch reform of inherited traditional bureaucratic systems of recruiting and training teachers and leaders and of paying and rewarding them and of shaping their incentives both short and long term, including their pension arrangements. There needs to be a constant focus on developing talent and building capacity. At the moment, all around America, I see fine examples of what is required, whether it's Teach for America or KIPP's leadership development programs or New York City's Leadership Academy. But at the moment, these remain exceptions to the rule, not the rule itself. In relation to human capital, there's a more profound underlying question. As McKinsey's report published last year said, uh, entitled How the World's Best Performing School Systems Come Out on Top makes clear, the world's best systems are recruiting teachers who have both the right personal qualities and come from the top third of the graduate performance distribution. In the US, most teachers are from the bottom third of the graduate performance distribution. Doesn't mean they're bad teachers, many of them will be brilliant teachers, but overall that combination is crucial to uh, the top performing systems. Without improving their underlying capacity to attract talented people, education systems will struggle in the future. This challenge is likely to be particularly acute in places like Wilmington, where there are so many of the Fortune 500 companies incorporated. In England, to address the massive teacher shortage we faced a decade or more ago, we completely overhauled our teacher training, making it more classroom-based, more accessible to people in mid-career who wanted to switch into teaching. And as, um, as Paul said in introducing me, when we asked people who were in other careers which, which uh, jobs they'd like to switch into, the first time we asked them out of 150 careers, they placed teaching 94th. When we asked them five years later, out of the same 150, they placed teaching first. More and more people are switching between the ages of 25 and 35 into teaching. We offered students incentives to go into teacher education programs. We quality assured the programs more carefully. We varied the incentives according to the degree of shortage in particular subjects. We introduced the National Teacher Awards and, covered, and they were covered annually on prime time television. And once the product, the quality of teacher training had improved, we vigorously promoted it through advertising on television in cinemas and we're still doing it. And the slogan was, those who can teach. The result has been several years of sustained improvement in the numbers, of quality, numbers and quality of recruits into teaching, including in science and maths, assisted by our own version of Teach for America, which we call Teach First. We also increased teachers' pay by about 15% over an eight-year period in real terms. But evidence from around the world shows that increasing pay on its own doesn't bring the returns you would want. For the US, the question of where in the long run it will find sufficient teachers of real quality, especially in science and maths, remains unanswered. I came across a medium-sized state with great universities recently that produced last year just one new physics teacher. You almost feel it'd be better if there was none. Uh, what is this poor uh, woman or man going to do all on his own to change the science challenge across that state? <laughs> Increasing the supply of teachers will require, an, in addition to major changes in policy, a change in the way teachers are perceived. TFA and similar programs are beginning to bring that about, but they're only beginning. Delaware's size and scale would mean that programs like that could make a disproportionately beneficial impact quite rapidly. All the evidence suggests that relying on traditional approaches to human capital will not be sufficient in this state or elsewhere. If the economic times are likely to be more challenging in the next few years than they have been until recently, both the need and the opportunity are greater. Changing a culture also requires leadership from those in government, business and the not-for-profit sectors, and it's great to see uh, this coalition of leadership in this state. The chances of success would be greatly enhanced, are greatly enhanced, if teacher leaders too become the leading advocates of reform. In the early 1990s, as Paul remarked, I worked for a teacher union in England, and I suggested turning the traditional case for investment in teachers on its head, instead of continuing to argue, as we always had, that if government increased our pay, we might improve the system, I suggested we should do the opposite. We should embrace accountability, improve the system, and then go to the public and say, look, now there's a system worth investing in. That would have been a complete knockdown winning argument in my view, but it required rather too great a leap of faith at the time. However, the history is instructive. 
In spite of teacher opposition, accountability was imposed. Schools did improve, and as a result, the biggest ever increases in investment in education over a decade, including in teachers' pay and professional development, did follow. Blair called it investment for reform. And while teachers did not always enjoy the journey, they arrived at a, be a much better, if more challenging, destination. Given the wide range of opportunities available, talented people won't flock into a profession with lockstep conditions and a beleaguered image. Nor will sceptical taxpayers continue to invest precious tax dollars in a system that doesn't seem to be working. Citizens the world over, like good businesses, prefer to invest in success. The challenge is to turn a downward spiral into an upward one, to build an ambitious future rather than relying on the modest mediocrity of recent decades. Which raises my sixth point. The extent and distribution of funding for public schools is a problem in this country. The benchmarks internationally suggest that America's overall expenditure on schools is above average, but compared to other countries, two distributional issues stand out. The first is that even after funding equity suits, often more money per student is spent in wealthier areas than poorer ones. It's easy to see historically how this came about, but to an outside observer in the early 21st century, it makes no sense at all. If all young people are to reach high standards, then the system has to provide greater support to those with furthest to go. A child age four of professional parents will have heard 45 million words. A child age four of welfare parents will have heard 13 million words. Overcoming such a massive language deficit is possible, but not if the school system merely reinforces the advantages of the already advantaged. The inescapable practical implication is that over time, states in this country will have to play a larger share in raising and distributing funds for public education. And Delaware, where the state already raises 63% of the tax dollars, has a great opportunity to lead the country here. The funding in the US is also skewed in another way which receives less comment. A much lower proportion of it actually reaches the classroom than in the best performing system. Much more of it is tied up in administration at a variety of levels. Of course, good administration matters, but every dollar spent on unnecessary administration is a dollar that could have assisted that welfare child to reach for the stars. In England, we required by law our districts to devolve the vast bulk of the funding into the schools themselves. Each school now has a three-year delegated budget based on a published formula. In effect, the burden of proof has been reversed. A pound or dollar should be spent at the level of the school unless there's a convincing pay case for spending it elsewhere. The Commission for Leadership on Educational Achievement in Delaware, I understand, is giving attention to these funding issues and will, will report in the autumn. That will be another great opportunity for this state to lead the way in this country. Along with the money, schools need to be given responsibility for how it's spent. The PISA evidence shows that increased management autonomy at school level is associated internationally with better results, but this is a lesson that remains to be learnt in many parts of America. Recently in a northern US city, I came across a good school principal setting out to turn around a failing school. She had all the right ideas, but no control over which teachers were employed in her school. She even needed permission from a teacher to visit a classroom. How can she be an instructional leader? What chance did she have? The contrast by, with a nearby charter school in similar social circumstances were dramatic, was dramatic. Accountability and autonomy need to go together. The question for every US state is not so much how many charter schools do we want, but how soon can all schools have something like charter-like autonomy? Similarly, all schools that spend public dollars charter or otherwise, should be held to account in exactly the same way, and if necessary, intervention should follow. Children are children, regardless of the status of the school they attend. Which leads to my final point before concluding. The PISA evidence indicates strongly that there are benefits in holding schools to account through standards-based external assessments. In the global economy, the question of national standards inescapably arises for the US. The emerging bipartisan alliance in favor of common or national as, as distinct from federal standards suggests growing recognition that the US needs, the, needs those standards that are fewer, clearer, and higher than currently. Moreover, Education Next's recent poll showed interestingly that almost 70% of parents would support national standards and over half of public school teachers. The truth is that across the world, standards in math, science, and English will inevitably, inevitably, 
be set by global benchmarks in a globalized economy. Quite simply, to succeed, countries will need world-class standards. Algebra and geometry don't change at the Rio Grande or the 49th parallel or the borders with Maryland or the border with Pennsylvania. From this perspective, the question national, of national standards is entirely straightforward. They will arrive anyway. The only questions are whether they arrive by accident or design, haphazardly or systematically, sooner or later. As they used to say in the civil rights decade, if not now, when? Let me conclude. The choice facing the US is, as I began by saying, a very stark one. It will shape America's capacity to succeed over the decades ahead in the profoundly challenging global economy. It will shape, too, whether the American dream in a stunningly diverse America is genuinely open to every citizen. The aspirations unlocked at the dawn of the civil rights movement have only partially been fulfilled. The school system has improved in many ways since that time, but surely no citizen of Delaware, no American, can be satisfied by the outcomes. There's no ceiling on what individual Americans can achieve, and that's always been true. But though enshrined in legislation, the high floor on which economic success and social justice depend has yet to be built. For those committed to a vibrant, successful America where the American dream and the American reality more closely coincide, there can surely be, in Martin Luther King's phrase of old, neither rest nor tranquility. It will be a long, hard road in Delaware to implement what you've set out. Many of you in this arena now know this only too well. More and more people are watching your efforts in this state and efforts across the US to reform education systems. They're watching and they're hoping. Counting on your success in this endeavor are not just children and families across this state and great country, not just the future of the American economy, not just the idea of the American dream, but all of us around the world in the 20th century, a strong, generous, outward-looking America was a decisive factor in enabling humanity to rise and meet the challenges it faced. As Golden and Katz demonstrated, public education was central to making that possible. How much more important, then, for everyone is U.S. education in the 21st century when the world is so much more complicated and challenging and the clock is ticking? At the bottom of the staircase in number 10, just outside the Prime Minister's office, there is an exceptional photograph of Winston Churchill. Facing the camera, he glowers with such defiance that even at that uncertain hour, wartime defeat must have seemed inconceivable to the onlooker. In fact, I'm told the real cause of his mighty frown is that the photographer had insisted that he put down his cigar. <laughs> Be that as it may, the time has surely come to heed his famous words, America always does the right thing, but only after it's exhausted all the alternatives. <laughs> In education reform, my friends, those alternatives have indeed been exhausted. It's time for America to do the right thing, and I look forward to seeing Delaware lead the way. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're very kind. Thank you. We have a, f a few minutes for questions. I know we have another session uh, that we need to get to in about 15 minutes. So we were going to take a couple of questions here, and then we'll take one from Georgetown. And I think that'll be about all we can take. But um, questions here? Hector, I see one over here, and then is there someone over on this side? Okay, why don't we start with Hector and go from there. Oh, that was a great speech. Finally, someone said, said the truth. Uh, Sir Barber, we have a situation here in Delaware where we have some like 800,000 people, maybe 75 to 80,000 kids, and we have 19 school districts. Each one of them is run like a fiefdom in and of themselves. And each one has their own political agenda. Whether or not that's for the good of the, of, of the kids, I don't know. In your opinion, based upon the number of kids that we have, does it make any sense having that many districts, or should they be reduced to maybe three? Um, I have this vague sense of political danger. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, not, I'm not sure why. Look, every, every, every country, every um, large system is um, both a beneficiary and a victim of its history. And um, that's, that's why you've got uh, 18 or 19 school districts. And there are a couple of ways of dealing with that, um, the complexity that that, that provides. One would be to uh, start on a kind of bureaucratic reorganization of the district redistricting or, uh, or whatever you want to call it. What, what the evidence shows is that is a pretty tough thing to take on. You get, for, you know, for all kinds of really um, uh, clear, understandable reasons. And part of underlying that is something really good about Americans, which you, you don't see nearly the same extent in, in America, which is a very strong identification with their own local community, which I think is much weaker in Britain, and we're, we're the worst for it. So, so part of the, the problem is actually a, a real asset. So the, I think that, I mean, I, I would, you, you, you might at some point want to um, uh, go down the ro road of some reorganization. In, in Ohio, they have um, nearly 700 school districts. In New York uh, State, similarly, uh, f it, it is really far too many for the size of the systems. But given that they're there, and um, given the question of the extent of political capital you'd have to invest just in the reorganization, uh, it does raise questions about whether you'd want to go down that route. The other way to do it is to create among yourselves such a strong leadership coalition for change that all of those 17 have to come with you. They all want to come with you. They are being driven by their citizens to come with you. They want to be part of this world-class education reform. And what you see, um, and it, it depends on political leadership, uh, it are some political leaders who can uh, build that, what I call a guiding coalition. And it starts often with a relatively small number of people. I used to say to ministers in England, two people can't get anything done, but seven people can change the world. But once you've got the seven, you then need to build out, you need ever widening circles of leadership. And one thing to do is to exploit the extraordinary commitment to education reform in this room and um, make it morally unacceptable not to be part of the journey you've embarked on. Other questions? Phoebe? Um, I, I read once um, in a book that was edited by Richard Majors that you had some of the same problems with the African Carib, particularly male students in uh, the UK that we have here. What have you all done to help resolve that kind of cultural problem and reduce those, I think you call them exclusions, we call them expulsions? Yeah. Uh, Yes, it's true that we do. We do have um, we, we, we do have a, a similar problem. That the, the, the history is different, but the but the problems in school are are, are quite um, are quite similar. And uh, what we've uh, probably the biggest single thing we've done is uh, lay it out in the data. We really we've got um, fabulous data. So the seven million school students in England, each one has an individual unique student identifier. So we have data that uh, uh, student ba individual student base for the whole system. And so we can track those students, not just um, by school aggregates, but right through the system, even when they change schools. So that's laid bare the problem, um, which is, uh, as I was saying earlier, is a great first step. Um, and then we've, um, we've worked on um, uh, uh, teacher attitudes. We've done analysis of getting the right relationship between uh, parents and, uh, and communities. And we've made some progress with that. But I don't think for a minute that we've overcome the problem. And I certainly uh, wouldn't want to claim that. I think we've got a long way to go. Uh, we've got some very good um, organizations now, particularly for uh, African Caribbean boys, um, developing their leadership skills outside of the school system. And we need to take some of that learning inside the schools. Can I just mention one other thing which is controversial in England, um, but I think is really important is Objective, externally marked tests uh, are a better um, form of assessment for those kinds of students than internally teacher marked set, uh, tests because however well you do them, uh, the teacher's assumptions go into the way they think about the tests. So um, I, I always get a, a bit of a hiss when I say this to teacher audience in England, but the evidence is compelling. I think we wanted to go, go to Georgetown. I'm not sure how the uh, technology works here on that. We can do that. Okay. I want to thank you so much for your comments. I so enjoyed reading about your success in England. 
And uh, I have a question on how you maintain uh, an open system, if you will, uh, whereby students aren't labeled uh, early, um, such that they might not be able, that their career path would be established early in their school life and maybe prevent them from being accepted to college. Hmm. Well, the, 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 I mean, in, in England, we're, we're still struggling with that. And the, what, one, of the, um, one of the risks of the, the improved data is that, that it shows you that certain categories of child are less likely to succeed than others. And then that quite easily can translate into a self-fulfilling prophecy. So what I always say is you've got to use the data to understand the scale of the challenge, not to justify underperformance. Uh, and this is, this, is a, this is as much about culture and attitude. In fact, it's totally to do with culture and attitude uh, uh, and not to do with uh, technical things. What the best systems in the world do, um, and here I'm not talking uh, particularly about England, actually. In fact, not talking about England. What they do is they have, first of all, they have very uh, well-trained teachers um, who are constantly focused on improving their practice. It's built into the way they work. And secondly, they have an assumption, a built-in assumption to the whole way the school operates that every child will succeed. Uh, and when a child falls behind, they don't wait for that problem to compound itself and get worse and send them off on another track. They identify it earlier so the teacher, to, teacher has the skills to do that. They use what might be called special education, but it's not like you imagine special education, or we have it in England, uh, where the, and this student will be referred there and the learning barrier will be identified. So what is the problem? Is it a social one? Is it a family one? Is it something, a learning, um, a learning barrier inside the child's brain? Uh, and somebody will try to identify the problem and then bring the expertise to bear to solve that problem and get the child back into the class as fast as possible. And that's what, the, the Finland is the best example of that. And in any given year in a Finnish primary school, about 30% of kids cycle through special education. Um, the special education teachers are paid more than the elementary teachers who are paid more than the secondary teachers in Finland, just to be controversial. And, um, <laughs> and they, their, 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 their job is to get the kid back up with his peers as, or her peers as soon as possible. And I think, that, so if I strip that down, there are two things. One is an attitude issue, an absolute expectation that every child can and will succeed or should succeed. Uh, and secondly, the technical skill to identify learning barriers early and resolve them and get them solved. I believe we're going to have to wrap it up there. One logistical note, then I'd like to give a, a thanks to Michael. Uh, we're going to be heading back to the session, the, uh, the, the plenary that we uh, left this morning. And we're going to hear a great session. I think Tom is going to be, Tom Connolly is going to be leading a session about how business uh, views this issue. Um, but before we conclude, I would like to give one more round of applause to Michael Barber. He's about to head off to a plane. <laughs> <laughs>